today's guest on the podcast is food and drink branding and marketing specialist Mark McCulloch. We hear his origin story and career rise in the marketing world. We discuss analog versus digital in the wine world. We talk podcasting and restaurants, brands losing their way and what to do about it, firing staff in order to protect culture, and he talks future projects. Enjoy. It's a bunch of stuff that all came together, actually. Um, and I started out uh, working in a record store. So old-fashioned sold CDs and tapes and all these things that people remember. And I was really obsessed with music marketing and the branding of bands and all these things. And it just really fascinated me that back then a single would come on the radio before an album came out. You'd have to wait six weeks, sometimes 12 weeks for something to come out. And then, you know, before long, I was selling it physically to people. It would come in, people had pre-ordered it or whatever. Um, and then you were reordering it because it was so successful. Then I, you know, putting the posters up in the window saying new release. Then a couple of weeks later, once they'd been on Top of the Pops or whatever and all the other shows, um, then I'd be changing the chart panel and moving the CDs up to them being number one. So I was really, really um, inspired by that. And then I was a failed artist, really. So I wanted to go to art school. And it didn't quite work out. I wanted to go to, to uh, the Rennie McIntosh uh, place in Glasgow. Didn't happen. Um, so I think the intrigue in marketing, the intrigue in creativity um, and being failed at that. Um, and then another thing happened where I went to university and um, I failed again. So a few failures, um, which actually helps you, I think, um, so I did mechanical engineering, um, failed first year, and I was wanting to go and do music marketing. But an old teacher came in to see me at the record store, and I, I ordered his jazz records for him, that's what he was into. And um, he said, don't do music marketing, do marketing wide, because then you can move into selling, you know, Wonder Bras or widgets or whatever you want, you know. Um, so there was that, and then fast forward in a bit, um, I ended up in quite a few digital places early. So this was around 2000, 2001. Um, I, I, you know, I was in uh, like agencies, if you like, that were motivation agencies, and it was all paper-based. So if you sold enough cars, you'd win the holiday as a, a car ship dealer, you know. Then I sort of spotted that the internet was here coming, put myself through night school to do... HTML, Dreamweaver, all these things so that I could talk to the creatives because I was a creative at heart. But also I was a business person as well. So I was in this neat, sweet spot where I could talk to the creatives in their language. I could also call them out if they were taking the mick out of me, if you like, taking too long. And then, you know, I could talk to the suits in business language and, and, and bridge that in the clients as well. And then the final piece of the jigsaw, I think, was, was really um, my mentor, a, a guy called Robert Bean, so I met Robert at lastminute.com. So he worked on amazing things like BT It's Good to Talk, Power of Dreams Honda, Ultimate Drive Machine BMW, Make a House a Home Home Base, and, and, and. And he taught me what brand was all about. And I had brand in my title at lastminute.com when I finally joined them as my first career job, I suppose. Um, and then he, he just taught me what brand was all about. And a brand was a promise delivered and everything that goes part and parcel with that. So I've got an awful lot to thank him for. So all that coming together means now I'm a consultant, I suppose, for a fancy word, that does brand marketing, digital, social and employee engagement for pretty much anyone. But I think you need to be famous for something. So I've retitled myself as the food and drink marketer and position myself there. There's other things that come up, you know, fintech stuff. Yeah. Did some van hire stuff, you know, weirdly. And, you know, it was really good fun, actually. And so I think marketing's marketing's marketing. It's just, you know, you understanding the industry that you're in quickly and then just deploying the discipline. And I think for me, like any good origin story, there's 
lots I've written down here and kind of lots of ways that I could um, ask and you know but I, I'm a believer that we'll kind of you know what needs to come out will come out um, but what I'd, I would like to it feels like because we've spoken before it feels like there may be a little bit that I think the listener will benefit from is actually just filling in a bit more about the the food and beverage part because I know that you've done several roles in the food and beverage industry so maybe just yeah fill in that part of the story so food and drink uh, I was always like I was a late Late starter, a, a late bloomer, as, as you would might say in, in the teenage romance terms. But um, basically, I came from quite a small town in Scotland, and the options for food weren't huge. You know, you either had you know, really good pub locally, um, maybe an Italian. The first big news that really happened was when I was maybe seven or eight or something. Burger King came to. 15 miles away and we all used to kind of have our birthday parties there and do all these things but that was it really and then I met my wife Pamela at, just after school she was still at school actually we were um, you know similar ages you know nothing weird um, so then basically um, we went to the first big fancy meal I think we had was like the picture and piano which was in Glasgow and you know, having the money that we had and, you know, that was that felt like a big deal. But I think the biggest thing happened was when I went to London. So I finished my final exams for marketing on a Friday. I moved down on a bank holiday Monday. Pamela, my wife's auntie, who I'd never met, took me in to give me a start. So I stayed just near the Thames in, in Cannon Street, which, is, you know, was an amazing place to stay. And then I started exploring from there. So... One of my first memories really was um, going to Yosushi and the one on Poland Street. And this was early. I mean, this would have been 99, something like that. And that was starting to open my eyes. So I really found that I really liked Japanese food. I really liked sushi. Uh, the first time I had it, I mean, it felt like something out of, you know, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. You know, you were just trying to get through it. And then... From having the jobs that you had then, you know, I worked with the music magazines as, as my first job, so I was working with NME and Loaded and all this stuff. And you went out with the client, you went out with, uh, you know, the other people, and I had to switch my mind, I had to switch my behaviour, I had to read up and research and all this stuff. You know, what? how do you choose a wine? What are the foods? What do they mean? What, you know? So I was in this almost anxiety laden position where when I was going out with people you know one of the first meetings I had I asked for pineapple and the pizza and you know and it was only, it was only pizza express but you know again the client was like oh I'm not sure about that you know so you had to have this kind of learned behavior where you started to understand the etiquette of, of being out and and you know discovering food and all that so then fast forward to after lastminute.com I went to Barclay Card and, you know, it was good for my career. I don't think it was good for me. Um, it just, you know, as you can maybe tell, I'm not particularly corporate. And I just wasn't really good at being a number eight or nine in the pecking order. Whereas at lastminute.com, you were sort of number two or three, you know, in, in, in your discipline. So from that perspective, you know, I was looking to get out. So I was flicking through the music magazine, sorry, the market magazines. And I saw an advert for Yosushi, and it was senior marketing manager, and the money was a lot less than you were getting at Bartley Card. But I thought, I really like them as a brand. I think they're, they've lost their way a bit. I think, you know, finding out you know later sales were down a bit and these kind of things. And they'd sort of lost their mojo a bit, so I thought, I could go in and help them. And then I wrote them a ransom note. So I wrote Yosushi a ransom note, which said, help... Or something like, you know, help, I've been captured by a bunch of bankers, please save me, sort of thing. So we did that, and then, yeah, that, that was it. You know, five interviews later, um, you know, I finally got the job. So that was me then into food and drink. And then two or three things happened there, which was you got a lot of autonomy early to have an opinion on the food, to have an opinion. I mean, they might not take it, but at least you were involved and then you were learning, you know, because you had real experts in the food in there. And then on top of that, uh, 
one of the days I was I was just in the office and Robin Rowland, who's the CEO or was the CEO, he said, "Oh, Mark, come on into uh, my office. I've got someone for you to meet." So this chap was sitting. Can't remember his name. French chap, and he was the CEO of Ping Pong who was a competitor. So my brain's frazzling because at lastminute.com you'd never talk to anyone from Expedia, like, no way. And mm-hmm. um, Barclay Card, rarely are you going to be friends with, you know, you're, you're all fighting. With food and drink, actually everyone's together. And I thought what was so beautiful was everyone was working together to get people to eat out and drink out. Rather, and, and even the, the blindest man could see that, you know, you can't be delusional enough to think that someone is going to eat and drink with you every single day. So it's almost this better together thing. And then the, the last thing was I, I met this amazing man or couple, actually, called Peter Martin and Christine Martin, and they ran something called Peach at the time, which is now CGA, Peach and CGA. So they gave me my first sort of main speaking gigs. I mean, I'd done a lot of speaking, but not in food and drink. And it was a little bit like when you went to these industry do's, because you were an outsider, in inverted commas, the biggest thing with being an outsider was that they were wondering what you knew that they didn't know. Because in food and drink, and it still happens, the person that's the marketing director for Wagamama goes to Itsu, then they go to Cafe Rouge, then, they, you know, and they sort of do the rounds. Whereas when you're an outsider, they're like, oh, this guy's came from digital and this completely different world. What you got to say? So that, yeah, that, that just really helped. So all those things together, you know, the generous nature of the place, the togetherness, the, the fact that you're there to make customers happy, whatever they're doing, uh, just seemed like a really noble thing to do. I actually think that, you know, we seem to be at a similar age. And I think that what I'm picking out as well, the story, is, is really interesting that you've had the experience with physical, you know, where, where you've had this this um, experience through the the marketing of, of music and you know being on the being on the ground in the in the in the music shop um and i just think it's something that i thought that was really interesting there was just like there's a kind of that barrier that almost because they didn't have the digital um product and you couldn't just sort of you know watch x factor and download the the thing that you had to wait it, and there was a a path you know there there was that kind of anticipation that was that was kind of built up could you could you therefore yeah just yeah say something about that just really it's that whole thing of the transition from analog to digital you know and and I know it's it's often portrayed as that's the big advantage everything is is quicker but are there even you know some uh, advantages to the kind of the, to the analog model and in, just in that kind of barrier and the anticipation and the building up and this you know the event of kind of getting that vine or getting that bottle of wine or you know having that meal just you know just be keen to have your thoughts on that sort of dichotomy yeah it's a tricky one I think just when you were talking there what was running through my, my head was you know you can digitize wine and what I mean by that is, it's the it's the it's just the distribution channel. So you know, a while ago, people would be saying, "Oh, it's not the same digitizing music or streaming it because you don't own it." But then, who knew that then the next generations coming through would be brought up living life that way and just expect to have music on them day in day out, second in second out. And just thinking about the wine thing as well, I think it's just being careful that, you know, there isn't the attitude that we can't, the digital world's not going to disrupt us because about two or three years ago, we were all very confident in the restaurant industry that it couldn't be digitised either. And it was like, oh, it's all about experience and it's all about actually people adapt really quickly and the are starting to say, well, actually, I'd rather be multitasking. I might rather be at home. I don't want to go into the restaurant. I need to go out, get dressed up, wait, you know, all these things. So actually what you're finding is restaurants could become, I mean, at worst case, a distress purchase or an occasion. And then at most other occasions then, or, or eating occasions is when someone doesn't want to cook, they're going to order. So with the, the, the digitizing of wine, I think it's, it's, 
it's almost where a lot of wine could then just become commoditized because if you draw the parallel with music, think how disposable it is now. You know, in the last 10 years, what are the albums you truly loved? Because actually, but the good thing is for the consumer, they're getting access to more music than they ever had. But the downside is that music's been commoditized. And then what does that mean? Well, actually, that means that wine companies are going to have to work harder on their own brand to then make sure that they are the ones that are ordered. And I'll come back to that in a sec, actually. Then there's where do you buy it? So I got wine on Deliveroo the other night. So sure, the shop still got the sale, Quaff and Portland Road and Hove, shout out to them. But, you know, obviously there's a commission to that. But then for me, they've actually got a sale they probably weren't going to get because I wasn't going to travel the 20 minutes to go and get it. And then on top of that, it's working with your restaurant partners to make sure that it's the best experience that's out there. So coming back to the brand part, I think what everyone's going to have to do is get their clear brand proposition sorted so that they stand out and it's a known name. So the people that are doing a great job at that are actually the ones that are probably more, you know, they're mass market. So you've got your oyster bays and your yellow tails and, but actually what, it's an interesting thing that people would ask for them first and wine type second, but in so many other ones, bottles of wine, you're choosing on the, the grape or the deal that you're standing in Sainsbury's looking to see what the biggest amount off is. So brand strength, I think, is going to be everything. And then at every moment of truth where the customer interacts with you, what can you do to make the experience as, as good as possible? The other thing coming down the track or is down the track then is obviously voice. So... When someone's ordering on Alexa, Google Assistant, Apple HomePod, whatever, then what are they asking for? So are they saying, I want toothpaste, red wine, and, you know, whatever else, gravy granules? Or are they saying, I want Aquafresh, Yellowtail, Shiraz, and whatever? They are then, or are they then saying, I want Santa Million, and then... The worry with that is then you'll get into a bidding battle within Google, which either who, uh, or sorry, within Amazon or Google. So then you're paying to be first, or are they doing it on you know, propensity to buy or, or rating or, you know, all that? So it's getting quite complex. So I think any thoughts of we can't be digitized, I'd just be so worried about that and, and really outthink that and what's the worst case scenario for you and start thinking about that and there's other things well I was listening to a podcast last night um, with Jim Stengel which is a CEO marketing podcast and he was talking about InBev he was talking to actually the InBev CMO but they've done things like you know they've bought Rate My Beer I think the, the website so again, it's those types of thoughts. If you're the wine company, should you be wine, should you be buying a data company that then gives you options on that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So there's an awful lot to think about. And I think the worst thing in the world almost that the wine industry has done is they've educated people on the grape more than the 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 actual um you know, wineries and stuff. So totally love and totally agree with what you're saying um you know i i kind of came in talking about the you, know, you you can't digitize it i mean i was i was thinking more in a sort of as a product you know i mean that's probably coming you know if we project far enough into the future but you know let, let's keep it sort of 21st century and and you know keep to the just you know, people's awareness and how do they find out about a brand how do they order it you know like like you say the the, the voice 
voices like a, you know I, I would say voices of beast you know it's just this thing that's it's coming you look at the number of speakers people have got in their homes smart speakers um i mean i think there will be blips along the way you know the 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 amazon thing of listening into the conversations and that but i i personally i just think that is literally that it will just be a blip on the way i just think you know last night i was trying i was about to write a message to a friend it was like it's going to be way really easier to just to just to dictate it um and you're right you know where you've got people's attention shifting to a a different channel then that's a that's a marketing opportunity and that's a that's a that's an that's is a marketing opportunity but then it, it is also an opportunity to to build the the brand as well and i no, i just think you you raise some some huge questions and you know important questions um i mean i i can i can speak to a part of that i would say in terms of you know my podcast and you know who i'm speaking with and you know i i'm now in year two um and i think people are people seem more open i think to to appearing and they they kind of get more you know why it's probably a good idea to come on and uh you know i've now got the data from year one and i'm able to say i had you know this many listens in this many countries so i think that's helping to to shift people along but you know there's more that i think that people can do and uh you know i i revisited it yesterday you know where the the idea and where i thought the podcast my podcast was going was actually getting into the production side of things um and maybe this is a a good sort of question to ask you really you know because we're, we're kind of singing from the same hymn sheet but with different backgrounds and you know i i personally don't know why i've got all of the amazing interviews that i've got and why some of these brands are not doing it for themselves uh the big example and i've i've said this to him you know is uh you know a chap called michael sager who's set up sager and wild uh owns i believe now three restaurants in london you know is a super influential guy his appearance on my podcast three times now you know has been all three have been you know far and away the most popular ones and i, I i've said to him like why don't you do this for yourself you know you 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 not so much you don't need me but you know i'd love of course i'd love to do it for them and you know produce it for them but i think it would be more all the more powerful if it were on the sega and wild page you know if it had they chose the music they chose the branding maybe you know they chose the person who did the intro etc etc and you know if we kind of choose our point and we just talk about podcasts i know there's a lot more to voice i'm just curious yeah are you seeing that as well are you, are you do you think similarly to me that restaurants and people you know wineries and all these guys should have their own podcast or do you see it slightly differently uh, well I, I i think there's a lot of questions in there so I'll try and remember them all i think the guests coming on yeah there's a whole bunch of reasons so it's something different i think you're pleased to be asked i think if you fast forward three years, it will be harder to get guests because more people will have podcasts and more people will do it badly and more people will give the guest a bad experience. So I think it's almost like the early days of Twitter. And I was talking about this on my podcast with the the Pizza Pilgrims guys. And, you know, back when Twitter started, you could get to serious celebrities by just tweeting them, not even direct messaging, because the groundswell was so low. So with, you know, the great guests and great guests that you've had, they're probably not getting asked every day to do this. So it's a bit of a novelty. It's interesting. It helps them do an easy piece of marketing. So if 50 people hear it, 100, 1,000, you know, it's, it's easy being a guest. It's easy for me today to get up come downstairs to the you know dining room and do this right you know rather than all the setup and thinking the questions and so it's 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 good i think on top of that you know there's a huge amount of ego in it that people won't admit to but you know you want to show this to your friends and say i've been on this and and also it's documenting something in time that future generations will be able to hear you know you know morbid thoughts but you think you know once you're away you know if you've got 10 talks showing some videos with you in and some podcasts and 
you know, it's not like your grandparents passing away where there's no documentation. There's a couple of black and white sepia photos and that's it. You know, you can't remember what they sounded like. Um, so I, I think there's a whole bunch of complex things, you know. Why don't they do it themselves? People are scared of what people will think of them. People are lazy. Um, and it's it's just a commitment. And I think people are also seeing that it's a bit like, you know, the old Pringles um, strap line. Once you pop, you can't stop sort of idea. It's going to look really bad on you if you do 10 and then never do it again. So I think people know that. But it's just a commitment. And also it's a generational thing as well. I mean, I know we're similar ages at the, the 40s or whatever. But I think we are potentially more tech savvy and, you know, but people that are our age and, and older, a lot of them are like, you know, no one's listening. And also the people are so personal about it. I don't listen to podcasts, therefore no one listens to podcasts. And that's the way so many companies do marketing as well. It's what the CEO thinks or the CMO thinks. And I think it's just the data out there. I mean, you see stories like um, Spotify's got to spend, is it 500 million? Am I right in saying that? Uh, something you might need to fact check that, but it's either 50 or 500, yeah. I can't remember, yeah. uh, on podcast companies. They're going to buy up podca- more podcast companies. So when that stuff's happening, the smarter people are looking at it and going, of Spotify are doing that, that feels, you know, like something's happening. And it was funny with podcasts because they initially had this great sort of launch. And then I, I was scoffing at people doing podcasts, maybe two or three, there was a couple of restaurant podcasts two or three years ago, and I was like, what are they doing that for? You know, podcasts are over. And I was wrong, you know, and actually podcasts have had a huge, huge renaissance, um, you know, and but I'd, I mainly listen to comedy ones, so I I'd, I'd don't listen to many business ones because I think it hopefully makes you a better presenter if you go outside your, your industry. I totally get a lot of that, and I, I you know agree I agree with that, and uh, you know partially it's it's speculation um, for me, you know, and I like this you know the Spotify thing. I think that I've I've got a Spotify moment, which uh, you know was was kind of fairly early into doing the podcast was when I saw that the BBC had hired a head of podcasts, and then then sh- I would imagine that that that's not a coincidence that then six months later you've got the sounds app coming out you know and, and their approach and um spotify you know taking out ads on the on the underground you know of, of we've got these guys exclusively on our, on our platform which again you know the head makes the connections with netflix and the streaming services and uh you know, it just it, you're. I totally agree. I just think it, it feels like we've seen the future in a lot of ways in terms of the how the Netflix and how the how the um, the digital video streaming services have have uh, have come about. And you know, I I I wonder if one of those might add podcasts on as a as a point of differentiation as well. I, you know, I don't I've not come across anybody that's doing that. That's you know, adding audio to the video. But it feels like I think the biggest challenge I think out there for podcast is discovery and it feels like the video guys they they've got that pretty good you know they know they know what you've watched they know what to sort of sort of feed you and etc cetera, etc cetera. so maybe it's a it's a wait and see you know while i've got you here i'm also very keen to you know broaden out the conversation uh, it might include voice you know i'm not gonna I'm not gonna be prescriptive but I'm very keen about this idea that you mentioned, you know, in relation to your view of ping pong earlier on, which is the idea of them kind of losing their way. Um, and it's a it's a comment that I I come across in the food and beverage and restaurants space, but it's all it's always seems to be something that's like whispered between people who are in the restaurant or you know people who are not directly working in the restaurant, and it almost feels like you'd never say that to to the restaurant themselves you'd never go there and tell them you've lost your way and that's um, who knows you know who knows how that would be sort of received so i'm just curious it feels like you've seen that trend you've you know you've worked through that process and and even you've been involved in helping people sort of you know avert that sort of death spiral if you like so yeah i was just 
you sort of throw the door open and you know ask you to sort of you know talk us through your views on on that brands losing their way what are the reasons and you know what what are some of the effective strategies you've seen for them to to think about yep so this was in relation to your sushi um so i think you know well ping pongs went through similar things but i've just not been on the inside enough to to comment but i think you know, I was saying actually off mic earlier on, it's how I make my living, you know. So brands that have lost their way is my job, you know, that's what I do. So what tends to happen is it's almost like a football club, you know, if you excuse the analogy. But we've had a couple of great nights lately um, on, on big English comebacks. But it's where, let's say it's Manchester United, back in the day... There was people that were from Manchester. The people that supported it were from Manchester. The badge meant something, and, and, and. Now, it's the same with a brand. Now, when you launch it, then what can happen is you launch it organically, and you don't actually need some specky brand consultant coming in and helping because the people who have launched this are visionaries, and their energy will infect everyone and there'll just be this momentum. And it'll be a bit rough around the edges, maybe, um, but generally it's all around a great product and great people, Mm -hmm. and usually sometimes a great location as well. So there's kind of that. Then what tends to happen is people either lose their way or they get investment or something's just been niggling at them that something needs to be fixed. So you get these phone calls. So if someone calls a brand consultant in for launch, usually they've got a lot of money or they've got their heads screwed on a bit where they're like, I just would like to do this job once early. Then what tends to happen is they'll get the brand promise down in the position and they'll get it all clear, you know, whether that's a bit later on or at the start or whatever. But then humans screw it up. And that's internally and externally. So what happens is you've got potentially a management team and lower layers of management that fail to hold people to account to live the brand values. They also make compromises on the brand. So, you know, it's a healthy restaurant, let's say. But they could make cuts in the supply chain. We should just stick a burger and chips on there, shouldn't we? Because sales are down. Or maybe we should do kids' meals and that's not their audience. You know, oh, let's just do a 40% off a couple of weeks. God, that went really well. Let's do another couple. In fact, let's make every, you know, Monday to Friday 40% off. Oh, it goes really well with the email. Oh, let's keep doing, you know. So it's just a short-termist nature. And if you go back to the Man United thing... I went to see Sir Alex Ferguson speaking and you know he's talking on business and leadership and all these things. And he said the reason that we were so good was that we only ever thought about three years' time. We didn't think about this Saturday's game. And that's the whole thing. But the pressures are you've got investors that want their money back. You've got you know CEOs that and, and C-suite people that want to achieve anyway. And they're bonused on that. And then you've got all the the competitors round about you doing the same thing, so you just join in. The external factors then are new waves of things happening that you just can't be agile enough to sort. So if you've got 120 sites and you're a French restaurant, an Italian restaurant, uh, and you've been set up the same way for 20 years, it's really hard to justify the case for you to change Stuff. So then what happens is people do a brand refresh. So they get some new seats and they change the logo and they change the colour and they do a new menu. But then they can't afford to do all 120 sites. So what they do is they do 10. And then in that time, the CEO is left or the CMO is left or they've been fired, whatever it is. Someone new comes in. I don't like this at all. I know what we should do. We should do that. And it just goes all over the place. So I think the, the, it's, it is back to football management, which is the best brands out there are the ones that seem to have consistency for long periods of time. 
So if you look at Pret, if you look at Nando's, if you look at Wagamam, and I know I'm talking about the mm. fast casual sector rather than, you know, sort of suave restaurants, but same thing. You know, if you've got that and you've got someone, at least one, if not a team, that would die for those brand values being compromised. You know, they would die for you moving the North Star, which is your brand positioning. So a great example in the drinks world lately was Carlsberg. So Carlsberg, amazing campaign where, I mean, this is a, a textbook case study on how to do it. You come in, the external world's changed around you, craft beer and all that. Internally, you know, you're seen as like a bit of a discount brand. You're, you know, not quite a cooking lager, but in that sector. And you do two things. Either, well, you do three things. You can market really badly and put lipstick on a pig, which, you know, doesn't really work out. Or you can change the product or you can change the promise. So what they've done is they're, I suppose, having a hiatus on the promise where they're sort of saying, you know, we're putting everyone in a holding pattern we're not the best lager in the world or beer in the world until you tell us we are. So then the playbook's going to be change the recipe, do all the marketing, fess up, be human, all that, get lots of people to sample. And at some point, I'm sure, there'll be a killer thing where it's like eight out of ten people prefer Carlsberg or they might even get ten, who knows. But I think it's about knowing their sector and it's 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 probably going to be something like you know the, the the best in that sector, whereas the best beer in the world ever ever ever. I mean that's just got so much harder to claim because of the the, the nature. But that's the way to do it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, and I'm I'm very happy to say I've seen the Carlsberg posters on the on the underground, and you know the. The, I'll try and leave a link below or yeah worth really worth a look um, something else I've written down which you know might not be the obvious one which is it's firing you know I I know that the two of us we're both huge fans of Gary Vaynerchuk um, over in the States and um, one of the things that he talks about when it comes to to culture most often but um it feels like that's very aligned with will you die for the brand? You know, it's like, how are things done around there? Are you prepared to let those things slip? Um, but if we, you know, if we assume that th- what he was talking about is linked, so the, the propensity to be able to fire your best performer um, in support of the the North Star and the, the longer objective, that was kind of what I took from that. And, you know, just sort of, invite you to, to say, you know, have you come across that that element, that needing to fire people, the the, the the need to actually get people out of the organization? Or do you think it, it everybody you know, it's sal- salvageable um, without going that route? So in terms of firing your best employee, you know, no one's bigger than a club. Alex Ferguson stuff. Apple famously said on a panel Sure, it was. Oh, yeah, I think it was Apple. And they said, "I'd rather have a hole in my business than an asshole." And I think that's right. So, have I been in a position where I had to fire the best person? No, um, it's just never really came up. So I've been lucky in that the agency that I had, and you know who I've worked with, and the teams that I've had, no one's been so good. That and out of control that you should fire them I have seen it but it's not been in, within my power to fire that person and then the last example is I think I was that person at lastminute.com so I pretty much got fi- I got offered other things but we had just done a huge brand project and my CMO at the time Simon Thompson is incredible like one of the most brilliant people I've ever spent time with. Um, I think for the good of the brand, sort of took me out, where his view, and I think it was the right one, was that at lastminute.com for a while, I was holding all the cards. So I was head of brand, 
you know, I was sort of in control of most things and a lot of things had to go through me. And I think being young at the time as well, I think I was 28 maybe, something like that. I think I was maybe rather bullish with it. So he then did a like 360 on me with other people and he mainly was the people I thought would, you know, get... I got their goat maybe. Um, So it was an interesting time to get that feedback where I would get shit done really well but I would leave a wake of destruction behind me and lots of people bruised. And I think that was an important lesson for me which was you've got to bring people with you. Um, So if you're running teams and all that... So I think, you know, in hindsight, at the time devastated, but in hindsight, I think it was the right thing for me to then go out into the world and, you know, look to broaden my skills and just not be this lone striker, you know, or mm-hmm. because I, I think he said an example that if he was in battle with me, would he work with me in the back room to sort out the strategy back then? And he was like, probably not. Would I send you over the top to kill everyone in sight? Definitely. So I, I think, you know, that was a, a huge turn in, in the career. Um, and then, you know, benefiting from that in terms of how to lead teams, motivate teams, inspire teams. But funnily enough, I'm sort of back out on my own again. So maybe I'm, maybe I'm happier being the lone striker. I don't know. Um, but I think... Just with the, you know, what's in me, and I'm sure what's in these people as well, you are just highly achievement driven, high energy, you want to get stuff done, and if people are slowing you down, you sort of want to chuck them off the boat or chuck them out of the balloon. Um, But then there's the other side of things that actually you'll benefit from growing high performing teams, but a difficult decision either way, it's really difficult, and also. If you're an agency, there's, there's times where maybe you need to fire a client as well for the greater good because of the effect they're having on your team. But they might be your biggest client. They might be the best name you've got. But that's another decision that you have to make. And I'll, I'll just say it, you know, Gary, Gary's fair, you know, very rarely wrong. Yeah, it, it genuinely feels like there's, you know, we, we're just scraping the surface, I think. You know, I think it's I really appreciate how you answer that question yeah. because... Um, you know, I wasn't expecting that really. I wasn't expecting you to say that you'd been, you'd been that person and, um, and almost in a way, you know, I'm, I'm sure, well, I I imagine this wasn't what you were intending, but almost, you know, that is potentially an advert and, and it, it can maybe free up the person that has to do the firing and say, look, you know, I think there can be, you know, in, in businesses that are, you know, where people have a lot of compassion, everybody has compassion, but you know, where you think, oh, am I sort of chucking that person out onto the streets? You know, we're, we're pretty resilient, I think, as a, as a human race. And, as, and But as an individual, you know, you've shown that you've, you've had that, whatever it was, tough love or, you know, but, but somebody has, uh, you know, and jointly you've come to the decision that, you, you know, that, you, that you'd move away from that, from that position. But you've, you've gone on and, you know, you've, you've, you've done great things. Um, so, and that's really where I'd kind of like to leave it, really. I think, you know, tell us you know a bit more about you know where else you're sort of showing up and i know you've got your podcast i know that's rebranded so yeah just do please do please let the listeners know where they can uh, where they can hear more of your dulcet tones <laughs> um, it feels like we're ending it on a downer um everything everything was fine folks um it was it was all good um so well I, just on that point again i'd rather get fired for being an overperformer than an underperformer. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of what's coming up, so I've, I've started this new business called Supersonic. So it's all about making people's brands boom. And what I'm doing is, you know, a lot of speaking, an awful lot of speaking, a lot of podcasting. I've got some great ones coming up. Um, we've already done Zan from Bleaker Burger, Pizza Pilgrim's Guys. Bill from Bills, Liam from Carlsberg, and Mark Ritson's coming up from Marketing Week, which I can't believe I got him on as a guest. He's like the greatest professor uh, in marketing that we, for our generation. And then lots of strategy, brand marketing, digital, social, employee engagement, 
e-learnings coming soon, mm-hmm. uh, non-exec director stuff. Mm-hmm. So what, it's taken me all these years to figure it out, but what I've figured out is I really like variety. Mm-hmm. And I think setting up a f- portfolio business has really helped sort of do that. So all I'm here to do is just make people's brands better and help them you know, and actually through all my training and all my years, try and give them big hitter experience for low hitter costs, I suppose, because in food and drink, we know everyone's margins are tight and things like that. So um, it's just to keep being a champion of the industry Mm. and just help people get to where they want to go, whatever that may be. So yeah, really refresh the energy and refresh the outlook on it and yeah, and wine helps, right? I, you know, I've, that helps me get through my, my toughest nights when I've got deadlines. So. Thank you so much, Mark. It was a real pleasure being able to share your story with my listeners. And I really feel like you shared a lot of value here in this episode. Please do check out the links below for Mark's new and his previous podcast, as well as website and main social media handles. I'm also super keen to keep sharing the marketing and branding advice. So if there's anybody in the space you think I should be speaking to, please let me know. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook where I'm at Interpreting Wine. On Twitter at Wine Podcast. Or email hello at interpretingwine.com. See you next time.